Ads heard before, during, or after the podcast are not endorsed by Paranormality Magazine or myself unless voiced by me personally. All other ads are pre-recorded, inserted by ad agencies, and are not under our control. Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. Mr. Fritz is a prized possession, carefully curated among the exclusive private collection of alternative entertainer Michael Diamond. Once a source of amusement and awe, the ventriloquist doll's head now sits mounted on a weathered wooden pace stick in a darkened room. Despite its decaying appearance, the doll still holds an eerie presence, its haunting reputation dating back to 1945 when many believe that Mr. Fritz obtained dark energy from its past making it a coveted but unsettling item in the collection. The head sits in its glass case, emitting an eerie energy that permeates the air. Its baldness is unsettling, the lifeless eyes staring out with a haunting intensity. The unnatural long nose points out to jab at the viewer. At the same time, the mouth twists into a ghastly collection of bloody lips and uneven teeth. But it wasn't just the physical appearance that gives off a chilling aura. It is the dark history attached to this decapitated head, bringing forth a malevolent presence that lingers in the present day. The mysterious origins of the doll remain shrouded in questions and uncertainty, with no concrete history to explain its creation or tragic fate. However, a small, handwritten note accompanied the eerie figure, shedding some light on its past. The note revealed that the doll was once a charming ventriloquist's companion, bringing laughter and entertainment to Allied prisoners of war at Stalag 2B during World War II. Stalag 2B, a hellish prison of barbed wire and watchtowers, loomed menacingly 2.4 kilometers away from the small Polish village of Hammerstein. Originally built to hold German communists in 1933, it was then filled with the captured souls of Polish soldiers. But the horrors did not stop there. In 1943, the first American prisoners were dragged into the camp, beaten and bruised from the Tunisian campaign. Over 600 men were crammed into Stalag 2B, forced into hard labor or nearby farms, their bodies breaking under the strain while their bellies growled with hunger. Each day brought fresh torment and suffering, leaving only hollow shells of men once full of life and spirit. Despite the harsh conditions, Prisoners strove to overcome their hardships by educating themselves and performing various forms of entertainment, such as musicals and comedies. One prisoner in particular, Private Billy Booth, stood out for his lively spirit and talent as a children's entertainer and puppeteer before the war began. Using materials he could find in the camp, he fashioned a puppet named Mr. Fritz from German newspapers soaked in potato starch and painted with a smuggled pot of pink gloss by a kind Polish farmer. The same paint had once adorned the farmer's daughter's cot, but now it brought joy and laughter to the imprisoned soldiers. For almost a year and a half, Billy Booth and Mr. Fritz had entertained the prisoners with their jokes and lively songs. Despite the circumstances, Billy's wit and charm were so infectious that even some of the stoic German guards couldn't help but crack a smile. But on a harrowing day, January 14, 1945, just two weeks before liberation, everything changed. Billy and nine other American POWs were marched out to a desolate field, their hands trembling as they dug a deep pit under the watchful eyes of their captors. With the cold metal of guns pressed against their heads, the sound of gunshots reverberated through the air like a deadly symphony. In a matter of minutes, lives were abruptly extinguished, bodies falling to the ground in a gruesome display 
of war's brutality. The haunting screams and cries of agony echoed long after Mr. Fritz had witnessed the massacre, the doll forever scarred by the chilling consequences of that unforgiving day. After enduring years of captivity and brutal treatment, the camp was finally liberated on January 28, 1945. Mr. Fritz, as much a prisoner as the men kept there, was brought back to the U.S. by a fellow captive. He was given as a gift to the Booth family, a symbol of their son's unwavering strength and ability to uplift spirits in the most desolate circumstances. How the mysterious Mr. Fritz came to reside in an antique mall in Myrtle Beach remains unknown. The dealer, whose identity remains hidden, had acquired him from the United Kingdom and transported him to the United States. However, upon displaying Mr. Fritz in his showroom, the dealer noticed strange occurrences surrounding the doll. With trembling hands, he locked up the antique shop for the night, dreading what he would find in the morning. Every day, without fail, Mr. Fritz's display case door would be wide open, even though the owner always made sure to firmly shut it before leaving. Worse, the lifeless eyes of Mr. Fritz's puppet seemed to follow him around the room, and his mouth would contort into an eerie smirk. The dealer tried rationalizing these occurrences, blaming them on factors like humidity or a mischievous mouse. One day he taped the puppet's door shut, only to return the next day and see that the tape had been peeled back and the door was mysteriously open again. It became clear that something otherworldly was at play here, and it sent chills down his spine every time he entered the shop at night. After much hesitation, he banished Mr. Fritz to the eerie garden shed where he remained for six long months. But even after his removal from the house, the children could still hear Mr. Fritz's unsettling laughter echoing through the garden and terrifying them. No one dared venture near the shed, fearing what sinister presence may linger within. Mr. Fritz's departure left the possession of the doll in the hands of Michael Diamond, a collector of the strange and unusual who soon learned of its sinister nature. The possessed doll's anguish continued to manifest itself through its mischievous and unsettling actions. The doll's haunting presence seemed to have a will of its own. When Mr. Diamond brought home Mr. Fritz, he knew something was off. He placed it in his freak room, a chilling display of his bizarre collection, and then the strange occurrences began. The door would creak open every night without fail, as if attempting to escape his confinement. One morning, Michael found the display case moved six inches across the table, drawn by an unseen force. The doll's new owner set up a GoPro camera to monitor Mr. Fritz at night. Created to entertain, the doll showed no signs of hesitation in front of the camera, its eyes and mouth moving with unnatural fluidity. The footage, captured over two haunting nights in September 2019, revealed chilling moments of the locked case suddenly popping open with no human intervention. No obvious explanations have been revealed, but the video is available online for the world to judge themselves. Despite ongoing debate surrounding the authenticity of Mr. Fritz's video and actions, some firmly believe that the haunting terrors of life in a Nazi prison camp, combined with the tragic end of its creator, have forever left an indelible mark on the eerie and garish ventriloquist doll head. If you'd like to see a video of Mr. Fritz in Michael Diamond's museum and the door popping open, I've placed a link to it in the episode description. A frightening incident took place at Hinawana National High School in the Way Bahol on the morning of Thursday, October 12, 2023. Up to 14 students were allegedly possessed by an evil spirit right in the middle of their classes, according to Staff Sergeant Donald Curran, chief investigator at the Loe Police Station. Sergeant Curran described the terrifying scene. Many of the students suddenly became aggressive and started screaming at the top of their lungs. They also displayed abnormal strength as teachers tried to restrain them. In my assessment, he said, it is likely they were possessed. They are not usually so aggressive, but they were shouting loudly. After being brought to a local priest for exorcism rites and examined at the rural health unit, the students finally calmed down from their hysterical state. 
Curran revealed that earlier on Monday, one of the students claimed to have seen a shadowy black figure. This prompted the school to hold a mass the next day, on Tuesday. This was the first time such an incident has occurred at Hinawana National High School. To allow the traumatized students time to recover, the school administration made the decision to temporarily suspend classes. Seventy-nine-year-old Pam Bond says she now believes in ghosts after having a frightening run-in with a shadowy figure one night in her hometown of Insplendel, England. The experience happened back in 1956 when Bond was walking home late from choir practice and spotted the dark, ghostly shape under a streetlight near the local cemetery. We all started screaming and ran home, said Bond who has lived in Insplendel for nearly 80 years. The village has long been associated with spooky tales and paranormal activity, ever since it was home to the prominent Weld Blundell family and their manor house, built in 1729. The stately Insplendel Hall still stands today, now occupied by nuns, but village lore tells of ghostly monks, unexplained car crashes, and most famously, the legend of the Grey Lady. According to local legend, she was a Catholic nun who had an illicit affair with one of the Weld Blundell men and subsequently drowned herself in the nearby lake. Some say her ghost now haunts a white cross near the manor grounds, a spot where medieval funeral processions were said to rest and pray before continuing on to the village church. While Pam Bond's frightening experience happened over 60 years ago, she says that ghostly encounter left her convinced that the supernatural tales of her hometown must be true. I've always heard the stories, she said, but after that night, I believe in Splendell is haunted. Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. An intriguing report of a possible Bigfoot sighting in Virginia has emerged recently. Harley, a man working at a sawmill in the Lick Fork area about three years ago, claims to have had an encounter with the elusive creature. During a break one day, Harley heard an odd growling sound coming from the nearby woods. When he looked over, he says he saw a large, dark figure peering out at him from behind a tree. Although initially believing it may have been a bear, Harley says the way it acted and moved convinced him this was no ordinary animal. He managed to snap a quick photo of the figure before it darted back into the forest. Later that night, Harley says he heard a series of eerie howls coming from the same wooded area and recorded them on his phone. A few days later, he allegedly found large footprints in the vicinity. Harley's account was recently shared by the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization. While tantalizing, his story remains unverified. The photo is blurry, and the recordings are difficult to authenticate. Skeptics caution that more concrete evidence is needed to confirm the existence of Bigfoot. Still, for some cryptozoologists, Harley's report adds intrigue to the ongoing quest to document these reclusive creatures. Sightings persist, but the proof remains elusive. Harley's encounter in the Virginia woods marks one of the latest alleged brushes with the legend. If you'd like to see the photo and video footage, 
I've placed a link to it in the episode description. Researchers at the Aalto University in Finland conducted a study simulating a zombie apocalypse scenario in the country. Using a mathematical model, they found that if just one zombie appeared in Helsinki, there would be only a seven-hour window to fully quarantine the capital or eradicate the zombies before they spread across the country. The model incorporated factors like quarantining infected regions and the difference between outbreaks starting in dense cities versus sparse rural areas. Estimating realistic parameters like humans' probability of defeating zombies was challenging due to lack of real data. While lighthearted, the study offers insights into containing potential real disease outbreaks. The zombie model could be adapted to simulate epidemics in different countries or used to study the spread of disinformation. The researchers were surprised at how quickly their model showed the zombie infection would spread across Finland. According to lead researcher Professor Paulina Ilmonen, the rapid simulated spread highlighted the need for an equally rapid response to contain an outbreak. The study made her reflect on moral dilemmas like individual rights versus population rights. While fictional, the zombie apocalypse model has practical applications for understanding how interventions could limit real infectious disease epidemics. The researchers suggest it could also model rumor or disinformation spread, which can act much like a contagion. Overall, the Finnish zombie study offers a creative way to gain insight into controlling outbreaks and limiting the spread of harmful content. And now we know if a zombie does appear, we've got about seven hours to figure out what to do. The Legend of the Loch Ness Monster, a mythical sea creature long rumored to inhabit Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands, has captivated the world for nearly a century. Generations of Nessie hunters have scoured the murky waters in hopes of catching a glimpse of the elusive beast. But a remarkable discovery suggests the creature's remains were actually found and destroyed over 80 years ago. According to documents uncovered by a recent Freedom of Information request, a sea monster corpse was discovered washed up on the shore in Gorick, Scotland in 1942. The carcass was reported by Charles Rankin, a surveyor for the town at the time. Upon finding the beast, Rankin immediately notified the Royal Navy, which promptly incinerated the remains and buried the ashes under what would later become the grounds of St. Ninian's School. Rankin described the creature as being unlike any animal he had ever seen. Contemporary drawings of the beast closely matched descriptions of the purported Loch Ness Monster. Due to wartime secrecy, the military prevented any photographs from being taken and covered up the incident entirely. While the story was largely forgotten for decades, the recent findings have brought Rankin's account back to light. Could this have been a relative of the legendary Nessie that wandered into the Firth of Clyde? Some theorize that its destruction explains why no confirmed sightings of the Loch Ness Monster have occurred in recent years. Skeptics maintain that the beast was likely a decaying carcass of a more common animal. But either way, the remarkable case of Gurak has breathed new life into the mystery surrounding Scotland's most famous cryptid. Perhaps the quest for Nessie isn't over just yet. Actress Goldie Hawn recently spoke about her long-held belief in extraterrestrial beings in an episode of Apple Fitness Plus's audio experience, Time to Walk. She told a story about how they visited her after she called out to them one evening when she was just 20 years old. That was a time when, you know, there was a lot of UFO sightings, Han said about her time working as a dancer in California in her early 20s. I remember this so clearly. I went outside my door and I sat on the little ledge and I looked up at the dark sky and I saw all these stars and all I could think of was, how far does this go? How little are we? Are we the only planet in a whole wide universe that has life on it? She decided to call out to any aliens that may have been eavesdropping. I know you're out there, I know we're not alone, and I would like to meet you one day. It was four months later when Han was working on a dance gig in West Covina, California, that she asked a friend to take a nap in their car. 
As she lay in the car, preparing to sleep, she said she got this high-pitched sound in her ear. While she heard the high frequency, Hahn claimed to see about three triangular-shaped heads. They were silver in color, she said, slash for a mouth, tiny little nose, no ears. They were pointing at me, pointing at me in the car as if they were discovering me like I was a subject, and they were droning. She also described how she could not move during the episode until she could burst out of it. Many years later, Hahn said that she met an astrophysicist at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign who wanted to talk to her about the said encounter. Goldie became emotional during the Apple Plus episode and spoke about how the aliens touched me and it felt like the finger of God. It was the most benevolent, loving feeling. This was powerful. It was filled with light. Hahn would later take an interest in crop circles. One day, a mysterious circle appeared in a field near where she was staying. The night before, she had dreamt about it. We got to the spot, and by God, I was standing on this hill, looking down over a valley that was dark. That was exactly the spot in my dream, she said. Regardless of if her experiences were genuine or something imagined, Hahn has remained captivated by aliens and is proud of her curiosity, saying, We can never, ever lose our wonder. It's just no fun. It's really an important aspect of being an adventurer where nothing is impossible. According to the office director established to investigate the incidents, the U.S. government receives dozens of reports of unidentified anomalous phenomena, more commonly known as UFOs, each month, with the potential for hundreds if not thousands more reports expected soon. The office said that they've received approximately 800 reports of unidentified objects to investigate as of this past April, up from 650 reports in August 2022. Sean Kirkpatrick, who heads the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office at the Pentagon, told CNN that nearly all new reports refer to objects observed in the air. Only one comes from a maritime sighting. Kirkpatrick said the vast majority are benign objects, such as balloons or drones, but some may result from America's enemies seeking to spy on the U.S. There are some indicators that are concerning that may be attributed to foreign activity, he said, and we're investigating those very hard. The report said the object sightings may represent an issue for flight safety. The report found that most sightings and observations come from near-restricted military airspace, likely due to additional sensors and radars around the facilities. A portion of the increase in reports comes from the Federal Aviation Administration, which monitors the airspace around U.S. airports and is starting to provide information to the Pentagon. About half of the reports contain enough data to be ruled out as mundane things, such as errant balloons or floating trash, Kirkpatrick said, but 2-4% to are truly anomalous and require further investigation. The report said only a very small percentage of observations have interesting signatures, such as high-speed travel or unknown morphologies. Kirkpatrick's office has transferred a lot of cases to police for further investigation and, if necessary, counterintelligence. But some sightings could potentially be foreign adversaries spying on the United States, like the Chinese spy balloon shot down off the coast of South Carolina in February of 2023. The annual report on UAPs put together by the Defense Department and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence said, although none of these UAP reports have been positively attributed to foreign activities, these cases continue to be investigated asked if the Pentagon could definitively identify a sighting of an unidentified object as belonging to a foreign adversary, Kirkpatrick said that his office is looking at some very interesting indicators of things, and that's about all I can tell you. But the office, which has more than 40 employees and is expected to grow, can't say that for sure yet. There are ways to hide in our noise that always concern me, Kirkpatrick said, Referring to the extraneous readings picked up by U.S. radars and other sensors, he continued, I'm worried from a national security perspective. But Kirkpatrick could explain why certain reports raise suspicions about foreign involvement. It could just be a foreign entity. It could be a hobbyist. It could be anybody, he said. And those are the things that we have to look into. Quantum jumping, also known as quantum shifting, 
is the controversial notion that a person can transport their consciousness to alternate realities or parallel universes. While dismissed by mainstream science, some enthusiasts claim to have experienced this phenomenon, sparking an ongoing debate about its legitimacy. The term quantum jumping was popularized in the late 1970s by American author Fred Allen Wolf in his book Mind into Matter. Wolf, who has a Ph.D. in theoretical physics, coined the phrase to describe the idea that a person's awareness can shift between parallel realities or universes. This is said to occur during deep meditation or visualization exercises. According to quantum jumping proponents, every possible outcome to every event exists in its own alternate reality. They believe that focused consciousness can allow someone to jump their awareness to these other planes of existence. This may provide glimpses of alternate futures, access to untapped creativity, or even permit communication with one's parallel selves. While admitting that it contradicts mainstream physics, quantum jumping supporters maintain that consciousness transcends material reality. They point to principles in quantum mechanics like entanglement and superposition to explain how mind over matter might operate. Consciousness somehow exists outside the limitations of space and time, allowing transpersonal experiences. Detractors counter that there is no scientific evidence to substantiate parallel universes or quantum consciousness theories. Mainstream quantum physicists contend that quantum effects operate only on subatomic scales, not in the macro world of everyday life. Accusing quantum jumpers of quantum quackery, skeptics say such fantastical claims only exploit misunderstandings of real quantum physics. Despite the controversy, many people claim to have experienced quantum jumps. In his book, Wolf recounts tales of individuals who purportedly reversed dire health conditions by transporting their consciousness to realities where the ailment did not exist. Others report using quantum jumping to tap creative insights, access advanced knowledge, and even preview future events. Noted figures like psychologist Jane Roberts, the channeler of the Seth books, have discussed consciousness transport between planes of reality. Roberts allegedly quantum jumped to connect with the multidimensional entity Seth. Likewise, Psychic Edgar Casey appeared to shift his awareness to access unconscious material and provide readings. While intriguing, anecdotes alone cannot substantiate quantum jumping. Alternative explanations like imagination, hallucination, or delusion may account for such first-hand reports. Since consciousness shifting is inherently subjective, it remains elusive to empirical verification. This raises profound uncertainty about the ontological status of quantum jumps. Ultimately, the controversy surrounding quantum jumping boils down to a metaphysical debate over the nature of reality. Do parallel worlds exist solely in mathematical abstractions, or do subjective experiences reflect access to legitimate alternate realities? Lacking conclusive proof either way, individuals must weigh the evidence and decide what resonates with their own worldview. Quantum jumping thus serves as a fascinating Rorschach test for one's deepest beliefs about the meaning of existence. An apparent ghost sighting during a live broadcast has baffled the hosts of an Argentinian television show. During a weather forecast segment on the show Fenomenos, the program switched to a camera overlooking a boardwalk in the city of Corrientes. In the footage, a ghostly figure can be seen running along the boardwalk before disappearing into thin air. The eerie scene quickly went viral after being shared on social media. Co-hosts Matthias Bertoletti and Jose Bianco were made aware of the clip during the broadcast and reacted with shock and confusion. Look what happened live, said Bianco. He's a person who runs and disappears. He doesn't have legs, added a perplexed Bertolotti. The hosts assured viewers that the footage was genuine and had not been altered in any way. While the figure's transparent lower half gives the impression of a ghost, skeptics argue it could be a camera glitch or trick of the light. Nonetheless, the incident has sparked debate over potential supernatural explanations. Further analysis of the video might uncover more clues about the nature of this unexplained sighting. For now, though, the bizarre event remains an intriguing mystery for the show's hosts and viewers alike. 
Whether paranormal or not, the footage has certainly captured the imagination of the Argentine public. We'll let you decide if it's a ghost or not. You can see the video. I've placed a link to it in the episode description. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.